So the question I want to discuss with you is whether fairness by unawareness is actually fair or not. So what does it actually mean to be fair? We have, of course, already talked about this. But um, what we learned in another project uh, with lawyers is that they have a very procedural perspective. So they say that a process or a decision is fair if the decision itself is not based on legally protected attributes. And this is sometimes called fairness by unawareness. And the idea is if there is no photo on the CV and you might not know the age, the gender of a person, how can you possibly discriminate, right? So I want to um, lay open two claims against this idea of fairness by <clears throat> unawareness. <clears throat> the first claim that I make is that using a discriminating decision-making system can be more fair than using a fair one. And the second one is using protected attributes might actually result in fairer decisions. And this talk is based on a cooperation with Hannah Hoffmann and Verena Vogt from the University of Munster and uh, with Mark Hauer from my own group and he will later lead the discussion. So what is an algorithmic decision-making system? I want to keep it very simple. It's an algorithm and we are interested in those algorithms that take as an input a set of people and either score them or categorize them, classify them into classes. So the question of course is, where does the algorithm come from? And on the one hand, we have so-called expert systems. This is a technology that comes from the 80s and 90s. That means you have coded decision rules summarizing experts' decision processes. Normally, these kind of algorithms are easily inspectable. So you have an idea on what the process is and you could rather easily judge whether there's a discriminatory aspect to it. But of course, today we're talking about learned decision rules. So these are those that are abstracted from data and human decisions of the past. And I want to give you a simple example for learned decision rules from the so-called AMAS classification system for the unemployed. Um, this case is based on a very detailed report by the developing statisticians, uh, that is uh, Hall, Kernweis and Wagner Pinter. And I actually think it is a blueprint on how you can be transparent about um, an AI system that makes decisions. So the idea behind this um, classification system for the unemployed is that the Arbeitsmarkt Service in Austria wanted to identify those people that have the most need for further support, for example, additional training or education. So they thought we need to identify those that will find a job anyway, because they don't need any further support. And we shouldn't try to help those that will not find a job anyway, we should leave them at peace and maybe also relieve the restrictions on them so they don't have to apply for jobs anymore, but they won't also get a support into that direction to get back into the job market. So the data um, is, so the model is recalculated every year and it's always based on the last four years. And the technical report is about one of these iterations and it was based on 850,000 cases from the last four years. And um, for each of these persons, uh, of these unemployed persons that came to the Arbeitsmarkt service and, and wanted to get help, um, they knew a lot of things for, of course. The features were very carefully selected. So the um, data scientists tried to identify those properties that would really be um, causal to the question of whether people can get easily back into the job market or have a hard time getting back. On the other hand, if you only have 850,000 cases, which already is a lot, however, you cannot have 
a high number of so-called features or properties that you um, work with, because otherwise your groups, so people that have the exact same characteristic with respect to the chosen properties will be statistically too small to say anything about their prospects on the job market. So they had to make a balance between the two things. So let me give you an overview of the selected features. For example, it was a characterization of the kind of unemployment and the number of times they were unemployed in the last years. This resulted in 50 different um, groups or flavors or values of this characterization. They looked for a nationality, so whether it was an Austrian, a European citizen, or neither nor, they had selected as a feature whether a person is a caregiver. They also looked at education, but they grouped all people in only three classes. So either you just have the minimum um, that you need to do in, in Austria, so the minimum number of years in school, or you have a formal training, or you are an academic. They also looked at age and built three groups out of that, and they selected gender. All in all, they have about 12 different features. And in total, it can be 60 to 70 different um, ways um, that make up my whole profile. And um, with that, they trained a statistical model. So what is the model? And I think Christian just made it very clear. As uh, data scientists, we have a lot of freedom to um, make design decisions, and that is such a design decision, which model you take and to which model you fit the data to. So in this case, they took something that is called a logistic regression, and actually they trained two models, one to understand whether a person is very likely to be easily employable, and another model to understand whether a person is very unlikely to be employed in the next few years. And in principle, this always looks like this. So don't be scared, it's easily explained. So here you have one variable and how this comes into being, I will explain you in a second. And here you see what the machine thinks about this value here on the x-axis. So if you have a negative value on the x-axis, you will, as a result, get a zero, which might mean this person is not easily employable. And if you have a high value on that x-axis, the result of the formula will be a one. And that means the machine thinks you are rather easily employable. So how do we come at this? How do we arrive at this x-axis value? So, um, in, in the formula, each of these features is one part of the input and it is weighted. So in essence, the formula for this X value is something like this, a weighted sum. You have a first weight for the first feature, a second weight for the second feature and so on for all of the features that we have. And then the machine tries to find out what these weights are. And it does so by learning them. So what does, what does learning mean here? For each data point from the past, we know the person's category, whether they were easily employable, not employable at all, or anything in between. So the weights of each feature are now heuristically, and I will explain this word in a second because it's very important, they are heuristically changed and we try to optimize the weight such that most employable persons receive a high value by the formula and most unemployable persons to get a low value. So what is a heuristic? We talk about algorithms a lot. However, algorithms have a very special meaning in computer science, it means that you, can, that you get a guarantee that the algorithm will find the best solution. A heuristics 
uh, is a procedure that does not guarantee a perfect result. And I have brought you as a visualization, uh, a labyrinth. So of course, if you are stuck in a labyrinth, you would like to find the shortest path out of it. But a simple heuristic will guarantee you that you get out of it, but it might not be on the shortest path. So what is the hot heuristics? You take your right hand and you always follow the walls on your right hand. And either you come back at a point uh, where you've already been, then you change to the other wall and then you follow that one, or you will come to the exit. So this is a procedure that guarantees you that you will get out, but it cannot give any guarantees on whether it's the shortest patch path by which you leave the system. And actually in machine learning, almost every single procedure is just a heuristics. So in that case, it means the weights in this formula are estimated by a heuristic. They might be very good. So they might very well fit the data so that it is easy to understand who's employable in the future and who's not. But you don't have a guarantee on how good the model is. So you see that here there are already a lot of design decisions. I'm, I'm not so sure that we can uh, find out what the consequences for all of them will be. So designability is certainly a problem. But at least everyone should know that it's heuristics, um, that there are a lot of knobs and parameters. And of course, they need to be laid open if we have an application um, in which we really care about the quality of the result. So coming back to this model, what does it mean? It means that in this weighted sum, if our heuristics decides that some of the feature gets a positive weight, it means that the, that the result of the decision will rather turn to, yes, this is an employable person, while if the um, weight that is found by the heuristics is negative, then the machine will rather tend to decide that this is not an easily employable person. So actually the um, statisticians were very open about one of their models to, to make the public understand how it works and it backfired. So we need to talk about transparency and backfiring effects because I actually think that this technical report is really a masterpiece of transparency, but boy, did these data scientists have a shitstorm to sail through. Why? because it assigns negative weights to women, to persons over 50 and to caregivers. And so that what we see is of course that the system is certainly aware of uh, protected attributes and people were really, really angry about it because they thought that the system is biased. So can its usage be fair? What is your opinion? Actually, we have um, on the reactions button you see in Zoom below, you can give me a yes or no, whether you think that such a discriminating system, whether you think that its usage can be fair or not. Joanna, can you give me a yes or no to see whether people are actually using that? So it seems I cannot see your answers, but you might have made a decision for yourself. So, and, and also this is something that Christian already hinted at. We cannot judge the system by itself. We need to understand the whole procedure to make an assessment of whether its usage actually leads to a better situation or not. And then thus we also come back to Sandra, because the argumentation of the AMS is the following. The system only supports employees of the Arbeitsmarkt Service to decide about further education of unemployed persons. The model only mirrors the job market's discrimination, so it's a discrimination preserving system. However, the AMS declares that they use it to support especially those persons that are discriminated by the job market. 
So the argumentation goes that if we didn't know about this discrimination, we couldn't balance it out. In that sense, the unfairness of the used algorithm is actually necessary to balance it out. There's a little caveat. We have not yet seen any numbers that the outcome of the whole social process of using the AMS system and the decisions by the employees actually do help the discriminated persons, but that's the argument. And just as an argument, I think it's fine. And if we can prove that the whole social process is actually making things fairer, then this would be an argument like Sandra made it. And then its unfairness would actually be necessary to help get out of a non-ideal uh, situation. So conclusion one is using a discriminating decision-making system can be more fair than using a fair one if the social process around it is designed such that the discrimination is detected and then balanced out. And in the same way, I want to ask you whether it can be even mandatory to use protected attributes. So now we've seen a system that is discriminating. It can be discriminating without using protected attributes. So, but might it even be mandatory to use protected attributes? So for this, I want to make you um, acquainted with another type of machine learning called a support vector machine. A support vector machine is easiestly uh, is the easiest explained on a 2D sheet. So here we have uh, persons and we know two hormone levels of them, which are absolutely made up. So criminoline and Sanftosan. And we know whether these people are malicious criminals or innocent citizens. A support vector machine will now try to find a borderline between these two groups such that almost all of the red square icons are on the one side and almost all of the green data points are on the other side. So in your mind, please take half a minute to find out where you would put this borderline. It needs to be a straight line. It cannot be a crooked line or anything. Just try to find a straight line that you think does the job in separating the two groups very well. I'll give you 20 seconds for that. So I hope you have your line in mind because now I would like to introduce you to Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller is here. So, and if I could see the results of the uh, survey, that would be great. Unfortunately, I can't. Otherwise I would ask you to show your hands or to show your yes and no, whether you think based on your line that Ms. Miller is on the green side or on the red side. If I would ask you, and we've done that uh, dozens of times, then some of you would say that she's a criminal or that your line thinks that she's a criminal. And most of you would think that she is an innocent citizen. So we need to talk about quality here. And this uh, regards to the question that I asked uh, Sandra earlier. So the question is, what actually is our objective function? Um, of course, you see that the data set is such that we can never have an optimal division line between the two groups. We always will make some error. Um, for example, we will have either malicious criminals who remain undetected by our line and or innocent citizens who are considered a criminal. And now the question is what you try what you try to optimize. So if you consider both of these errors to be equally bad, even in that case, if you would agree on that objective function, then we would have at least three lines that would be equally well in that case. And Ms. Miller would 
um, be between these lines. So for one of the lines, she would be on the red side and for the other two lines, she would be on the green side. However, maybe you don't agree with me um, or with that default setting that the two errors are equally bad. William Blackstone, a philosopher of law said in 1760, it is better that 10 guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer. And Dick Cheney, who you might also recognize, uh, said in an interview concerning uh, the legality of Guantanamo Bay, I am more concerned with the, uh, with the bad guys who get out and released than I am with a few that in fact were innocent. So the few that were innocent are estimated to be about 25%. So you see that these two men have very different ideas about the correct ratio between innocent people that are falsely positive and people that get out and release. And so they would create very different lines. William Blackstone's would be high above to make sure that none of the innocent people is regarded as a criminal and Dick Cheney would do just the opposite. So this is one thing that we need to care about. It's one design decision. However, let's now look at another feature that we didn't have knowledge about in the first place. Let's look at gender. So I've now added the gender to each of these data points. And you see that if we use one of these lines, which is my favorite line that I normally use, then we would actually discriminate against men because we have two green data points that are both male and that are falsely above the line. And the two criminals that escape the decision of the system are actually females. If I now use this feature and fit two models instead of fitting one, ignoring the gender information, this would happen. So in both cases, we would have a perfect division line between the green ones and the red ones or the innocent people and the citizens. We think it's really easy to argue that in such a clear case, it is mandatory to use the protected attributes. But there are of course some obvious que uh, questions. How much better must the two models be than the one unaware to be mandatory? What's with mixed cases? So if one of the groups is better off in a, in a separated model and the other one is not, what if these two groups have different sizes? In any case, we think that it's fair to conclude that using protected attributes might result in fairer decisions, but there are of course many open questions by this. So in summary, um, the idea of fairness by unawareness can result in less fair decisions than using protected attributes because they can help to mirror and to balance out discrimination in uh, with respect to what Sandra said as um, an equality that tries to understand the outcome of a decision process, and they can help to model differences um, better by using the con corresponding properties if there is actually a difference in the groups that are defined by the protected attributes. Also here, I think there are many open questions and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion with all of you. So should jurisdiction actually focus on individual design uh, decision processes or watch out for a statistically significant disparate impact? I think that question was more or less already answered by Sandra in the affirmative. Under which circumstances are discriminating ADM systems necessary and might even be mandatory given the social embedding? Under which circumstances under which circumstances is it mandatory to use protected attributes to make fair decisions? And last but not least, what about human decision making? So should they maybe also be allowed 
to use protected attribute if they are trained properly in how to use them. In essence, I hope I could convince you that a process is not necessarily fairest if the decision is not based on legally protected attributes. Whether this is enough to proclaim a fairness by awareness, I don't know, but I'm looking forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you very much.